Let us call ourselves to worship by reading together Psalm 23. It is printed on the second page of your bulletin. Let us read together. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Let us pray. <clears throat> o God, who gave us birth, you are ever more ready to hear than we are to pray, and you know our needs before we ask. Show us now your grace that as we face the mystery of death, we may see the light of eternity. Speak to us once more your solemn message of life and death and help us to go to live as those who are prepared to die. And when our days here are ended, enable us to die as those who go forth to live so that living or dying, our life may be in Jesus Christ, our risen Lord. Amen. Hear these words of comfort from the scripture, first from Psalm 91. Those who live in the shelter of the Most High, who lodge under the shadow of the Almighty, say of the Lord, He is my refuge, my God in whom I put my trust. He will rescue you from the fowler's snare and from deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his wings. You will find refuge beneath his pinions. You will not fear the terrors abroad at night or the arrow that flies by day. For he will give his angels charge over you to guard you wherever you go, to lift you on their hands for fear that you to strike your foot against a stone. Thus says the Lord, when they call to me, I shall answer. I will be with them in time of trouble. I shall rescue them and bring them to honor. I shall satisfy them with long life and show them my salvation. And from 2 Timothy 4, verses 6 through 8. As for me, I am already being poured out as a libation, and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. From now on, there is reserved for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on that day, not only to me, but also to those who have longed for his appearing. Amen.
Hear these words from the 16th chapter of John. Jesus knew what his disciples wanted to ask him, and he said to them, Are you discussing among yourselves what I meant when I said, A little while and you will no longer see me, and again a little while and you will see me? Very truly I tell you, you will weep and mourn, but the world will rejoice. You will have pain, but your pain will turn into joy. So you have pain now, but I will see you again, and your hearts will rejoice, and no one will take your joy from you. Let us pray. And Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Soon after his wife died, Duke McCall, a former president of Southern Baptist Theological Seminary, was approached by a fellow church member who said to him, I'm sorry you lost your wife. Dr. McCall re responded by saying, I did not lose my wife. I know where Marguerite is. I am the one who is lost. We can relate to that today, can't we? Think about it. No one in this room has ever known a world without Helen Helms in it. So naturally, we feel a sense of lostness, a feeling that something has gone wrong. And so we grieve together and we share our sorrow. In the Gospel of John, Jesus said to his disciples, you now therefore have sorrow, but I will see you again, and your heart will rejoice, and no one will take your joy from you. Jesus said, go now and have sorrow. Today we must affirm that human beings do not belong to one another. We are God's children. We belong ultimately to God. And it is by sheer grace that we are together for a time, for a little while. We receive God's gift of another person in our lives with thanksgiving. But we must realize that this person is a gift. We cannot hang on or refuse to let go. Helen Helms was a gift, one of God's own children. And for a time, for a long time, <clears throat> God gave Helen to the world in order that Bill and Edith might have a daughter, in order that three boys and two girls might have a sister, a sister who took on the responsibility of caring for them throughout their lives, in order that Ned might have a loving and supportive wife, in order that Don might have a caring mother and model for faith. God gave us Helen so that our church and community of Wingate might have someone wholeheartedly devoted to their well-being. God gave us Helen so that the people of Wingate might see selfless, unassuming service lived among us through the power of the Holy Spirit. For she never wanted to draw attention to herself. Helen quietly lived her faith in God without thumping a Bible in someone's face. She exemplified what St. Francis said, preach the gospel at all times, and if necessary, use words. By her faithful character, Helen lived out the gospel without having to talk about it, and we are the better for this gift. God gave us Helen that we might know a fiercely independent woman who still knew what it meant to be a loyal friend who was always there to give a listening ear. God gave us Helen so that Wingate Baptist Church might have someone always willing to share her gifts, 
She served her church for over 20 years as a church secretary. Now, I'm the son of a church secretary. And I know that even though the pastor's name may be on the sign out in the front, it's the church secretary who keeps things working and going forward in the church. And that was certainly the case with Helen. When asked by a nurse recently the secret to living to be 100 years old, she, with a twinkle in her eyes, simply responded, just don't die. <laughs> <clears throat> but even as she faced the challenges that come with age, she continued to give of herself in every way she could, especially in those latter years, supporting her church in that most important of ways, regular and passionate prayer. What a wonderful gift. Because of Helen and her commitment to her Lord, we understand more fully the greatness of the love of God. God loved the world so much that, it gave it, that he gave it Helen, and that was good of God. You and I did nothing to deserve Helen. God gave her to us freely not because we deserved her, but because God loved us. So now we come together as friends and family to say goodbye to one of God's own children. Jesus said, you now have sorrow, but I will see you again, and your heart will rejoice, and no one can take your joy from you. So in the end, we gather today as a people of hope, a hope born of faith in God, in simple, trust-like trust, childlike trust in the goodness of the Almighty, the kind of trust Helen had in which she passed on to all who knew her. In our grief, we have asked, if a man dies, if a woman dies, will they live again? And in faith, we answer, yes. A thousand times, yes. Someone has said the resurrection to eternal life takes on meaning when we begin to people heaven with those we love. So in faith, we are given a vision of God's heaven. We do not know very much about the life beyond death into which our loved ones have entered. The Bible paints it only in a few broad strokes, and even Jesus himself said very little about it other than to assure us that it exists and awaits us. So this morning, I want to close by offering a vision of heaven, a portrait that was painted by a friend of mine. And my prayer is that its vision will convey heaven's reality to you. Imagine the best, and it is better. Imagine the most beautiful there is, and it is better. Picture a world where each person makes a difference. Each makes a contribution. And everybody knows life is better because of the gift each brings. Picture a world where every unblessed child has a beaming parent telling people on the street, this child is mine and I'm so proud of her. Imagine a world where there is more than enough food for everybody and none of it goes to waste. Imagine a world where everybody has a room and everybody is perfectly content with the place that was made just for them. And imagine you. You get up in the morning wanting to do what's right. And that's exactly what you do. As you do good, you never get bored with it. You get a kick out of it. It feels right. It fits like an old shoe. It's so much fun doing good, some days you sneak off by yourself late at night when nobody is looking and you do some more good. 
it no longer seems strange for you to do what is right and loving and just. It's what comes naturally to you. And you go to bed at night with no regrets, no remorse, no second thoughts. No one is upset with you. No one has misunderstood you. No one has been offended by you. You go to sleep thinking to yourself, life just can't get any better than this. And in the morning when you wake up, it does. Imagine that. Heaven can have a power in our lives. We can borrow from its vision to put our hurts into perspective. Heaven can tutor our hopes. Our longing for the world yet to be teaches us about God's longing for the world that is. We long for heaven and still love earth. We can long for heaven and not assume we have a problem. Longing for God's heavenly kingdom is no grown-up version of a child's longing to see Disney's magic kingdom. My friend goes on. He says, for some reason or other, our four-year-old son, Jonathan, began asking his mother some questions a few months ago. The conversation went like this. Jonathan asked, Mommy, when do we go to live with Jesus? And Joe responded, when we die. Jonathan then asked, will Jesus have any food? And Joe, responding this time with a smile, said, Yes. Jonathan pushed the issue. Will Jesus have food that I like? <laughs> Joe, smiling wider, said, yes. Jonathan had one more question in him. Will Jesus have macaroni and cheese? <laughs> and Joe, responding, no doubt, like God will, said, yes. Then the Jonathan jumped clapped his hands and said, oh, goody. Whatever heaven is, there is a room, a food, a hope, a healing, a future, with Helen Helm's name on it, and all our names if we want it. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. O oh God, before whom generations rise and pass away, we praise you for all your servants who, having lived this life in faith, now live eternally with you. Especially we thank you for your servant, Helen, whose baptism is now complete in death. We praise you for the gift of her life, for all in her that was good and kind and faithful. For the grace you gave her that kindled in her the love of your dear name and enabled her to serve you faithfully. We thank you especially for those godly qualities of commitment, nurture, service, and generosity, which she strove to fulfill in her family and church and community. We thank you that for her death is past and pain ended and that she has now entered the joy you have prepared. For in Jesus Christ, you have promised many rooms within your house. So give us faith to see beyond touch and sight some sure sign of your kingdom. And where our vision fails, Help us to trust your love, which never fails. Lift our sorrow and give us good hope in Jesus so that we may bravely walk our earthly way and look forward to glad reunion in the life to come. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.